Have you enjoyed the rain? I told Robin, if I wasn't a Baptist, I'd go out and dance in it. You know why we Baptists don't dance? Because we're terrible. We need to hang out with the Methodists more, right? Amen. <clears throat> Let's stand together and open our Bibles to 1 Timothy. And we're going to look at uh, chapter 6 this morning as we talk about embracing generosity. Embracing generosity. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be so proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we continue to examine your word, as we talk about embracing our future, this voyage that we are on called life, Lord, I pray that we will make you priority in all things, not some things, in all things. So God, give us an open heart to hear and understanding and a passion to obey. And this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I have been your pastor for 25 years now. Started here when I was 20 years old. <laughs> and I want to tell you something, and I mean this before God, I am the most excited I have ever been about Spring Baptist Church and I believe that we have more potential today than we've ever had in the history of our church. And I think that you might just agree with me, do you? The fields are wide unto harvest. We pray for laborers so that we can get done what God has called us to get done. The mission of the church that we mentioned last week, the mission, the purpose of the church. Are we doing all that God has called us to do? So when we talked about this campaign, so to speak, embracing the future, I told you last week that our goal is 100% involvement, 100%. Well, preacher, you're so naive. I'm only naive if you're disobedient, amen? Every single one of us can participate in this from children up to senior adults, every age in between. All of us can participate and make a difference for the kingdom of God. I'm telling you this morning that this particular series that we're in right now is not just another series. This series is going to help shape our future as a congregation. It's going to give us a track if you will, to run on. It's going to bring clearer, a clearer message to what our mission is as a congregation. So we are embracing our future as God would have us embrace it and not as we might choose to embrace it. Now, the goal of this is not to get us all on the same level. That's not the goal. We're always going to have different spiritual levels in any church. If you don't, then you're not doing your job as a congregation. One time I had a senior adult years and years ago said, I wish these teenagers would learn how to act in church. And I told her, I said, I hope we always have teenagers that don't know how to act in church. Now it's our responsibility to teach them how to act in church, but many of them don't come from Christian backgrounds. Do you understand that? Many of them have never sat in a church service before. And so they come in at a certain level. We cannot expect those who are babes in Christ to behave the way those who've been Christians for 30 and 40 and 50 years of their life. We cannot expect that. So here's the, here's the goal. Not to get us on the same level, but to challenge every single one of us to grow in the Lord. To move beyond our current status. And would you agree with me that there's always room for growth in every Christian's life. Would you say amen if you believe that? Now this initiative is going to take money. I've told this joke to you before about the king who summons his wise men. And he told his wise men, I want you to get all the wisdom in the world and compile it for me so I can have it. 
And so they did. And they came back with a 12 volume set of all the world's wisdom. He said, I'm too busy as a king to read 12 volumes of wisdom. Can you condense it? And so they came back with one book. And he said, really, I'm too busy even to read that one book. Can you condense it even more? And so they came back with one paragraph. And he said, really, I'm too busy to even read that. Can you come back with even less than that? And so they finally came back with one sentence. And you know what it was? There ain't no free lunch. Everything in life costs money, am I right? Everything in life costs money. Our annual income, I told you last week, is about four and a half million dollars per year. Over the next two years, assuming that God blesses as he has in the past, we will take in about nine million dollars as a congregation. The challenge is, I'm asking you to give a million dollars more each year for a total of 11 million dollars over the next two years. I've shared with you, we're not gonna hire more staff with that. We're gonna do some things that we need to get done. As uh, the end of the summer always is, we're a little bit behind on our budget, so we need to catch up on our budget. And then after we catch up on our budget, we need to start looking toward the future as to what God would have us do. I'm going to mention some of those things in the sermons to come. So let's keep that in mind. Now you might ask, how can we do it? Those who are not tithing, if you'll be faithful and ask God to help you tithe and start tithing, then we can do it. Those who are already tithing, tithe means 10%. If you will give more than the tithe, then we can do it. Those who have more, God's word tells us, are expected to give more. So roughly, Jason told me, if we have 500 giving units that will participate in this challenge, 500 giving units that will participate in this challenge, we will meet the goal of taking in not four and a half million dollars this next year, but five and a half million dollars the next year. That's a good thing, isn't it? So I went shopping. I wish I could say if I'd been so lucky to actually go to Piggly Wiggly. Do you want to see this side or that side? <laughs> Piggly Wiggly. Oh, I should be so blessed as a gone. But anyway, I went to H-E-B. That's about, I guess, I guess as close as we've got to a Piggly Wiggly around here. And so I started for looking for items that cost $2. And you know what I found out? You can't find very many things that cost $2. You really can't. And you certainly can't find hardly any name brand stuff that costs $2. So men, the next time your wives go grocery shopping and you, co you complain about the grocery bill, next time you go and you're going to find out what I found out. Ain't nothing cheap right now in the grocery stores. However, I did find one thing that I really do like, goldfish. <laughs> Anybody like those? Goldfish. And... Not a name brand, but H-E-B, Texas corn chips. I've not eaten them, not tried them. But instead of Fritos, you can get these for two bucks. All right. Now, here's something else. Anybody here like Cheez-Its? H-E-B brand, $2. Uh, how about Honeygrams? $2. All right, right there. Uh, a king-size Twix bar. I am going to eat that later. <laughs> All right. Does anybody here like um, V8? Anybody here like V8? Who, you like, come up here. You like V8? Come here. This says it's 100% vegetable juice. You can actually get two of these for $2. Here you go. You keep it. I don't ever want to see that again. <laughs> that is disgusting. Swiss Miss hot chocolate, two bucks. Sponges, two bucks. I can pull out other things, but I think you get the gist of what I'm talking about. There's not much you can buy at the grocery store for $2. However, here's the challenge. If each of us will make a commitment to sacrifice and give God $2 either more a day or start giving God $2 a day, or if you're not fully tithing, you're going to raise it up and try to move toward that goal. And I know some of us, uh, we get in a financial jam and we think I can't tithe, but I'm telling you, who here can't raise, can't give $2 a day to the Lord? Is there anybody? We can all do that, amen? We can give $2 a day more to the Lord than what we've given. It'll roughly be $60 a month, 
but it's two dollars a day and with our electronic system you can give online you can do it every day two dollars two dollars two dollars two dollars or you can do it however you normally give you do it however you want to but it'd be less painful for some who are not giving anything i'll start the guy know god wants me to give to the church i'm going to start so i'll give up uh, a half a cup of plain coffee at starbucks how much does coffee at Starbucks cost? It's a lot, isn't it? How much does it cost at McDonald's? A dollar? All right, start going to McDonald's for your coffee. In blind taste test, McDonald's wins over plain coffee versus Starbucks. So go to McDonald's, all right? Well, I've got to have my upside down caramel frappuccino. I have no idea what that is. I've heard people say it on TV. We can all do this. So I'm asking you to make a commitment and we're going to have a, a little card in the next sermon or two that I'm asking you to put your name on the dotted line saying, I will participate in this challenge, every single one of us. Now, the gospel, if you think about it, is really a story about generosity. Well, the Bible says that God the Father gave God the Son. And the Bible says that God the Son gave His life. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit? Now, would you agree with me that God has been good to you? Come on now. God's listening. And we'll give you a chance to redeem yourself. Has God been good to you? So we see throughout our life, throughout the past as we read the Bible, and we'll see it in the future, that God is all about giving. He gives to us and gives to us and gives to us. And I'm challenging you and myself to give to him. Robin and I are going to participate in this. I'm challenging you to do it as well. We're going to give to him. You may be prosperous in life, but let me ask you something. Are you generous in life? Because that's what God measures. Remember the, the widow that only had two, two little pennies basically is what they were. And she gave and the Lord said she gave more than all of you did. She gave more than all of you did because she gave what she could give. You know, people in Seattle, I was up there a few years ago meeting with some church planters and they absolutely hate churches. The only thing they hate more than churches are pastors. But I was asking those church planters, why is there such a hatred for the church up here? And they said, because they see the church as draining resources from the community and giving nothing back. I don't want that to ever be said about Spring Baptist Church, do you? So in the future, we already do some of these things, but we're going to hype it up a little bit and we're going to figure out ways that our community can use our facilities here at Spring Baptist Church, our schools, our police, our fire department, a place for senior adults to gather, a place for kids, sports and tutoring, a host of business function if that wants to be done, or a place for children to come up here and play. And we're seeing a little playground over here used more and more often throughout the week, people coming up and using the playground. Men and women's Bible studies, we already do those. We're going to bring it up a notch and, and invite the community to come and participate in these things. And all of it will start with generosity. Because if we don't give to support those things, we can't do those things. We can't. I want to share with you three things this morning if you're taking notes. We are to identify in Christ and not in stuff. Identify in Christ and not in your stuff. In verse 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. What does that word proud mean? It means puffed up. They're proud because they got a lot of money. They're puffed up or they're arrogant because they have a lot of money. Now, money, we all know this, can be perceived as a status symbol, right? Because money allows you to live in a certain neighborhood. It allows you to drive a certain kind of car. It allows you to wear certain kind of clothing. And we could go on and on with that list. But let me tell you something money does not do. It does not determine your value. Now, don't misunderstand me. I've known rich people who are evil and some that are good, and some that are kind, and some that are mean. And I've known poor people that are evil, and some that are good, and some that are kind, and some that are mean. Money's got nothing to do with it. The character comes out. And so whether you be rich or poor or somewhere in between, like probably most of us are in this room right now, 
That does not determine who you are as a person. And Paul says right here, don't do that. Don't think just because you've got money that you're better than everybody else. In other words, he's saying that Christians dare not identify themselves in what they own, but Christians identify in who owns them. Who owns you, church? The Lord Jesus, amen? God owns us. And that's how we identify. There was a teenager at football practice and he got mad at the coach and he said, I quit. I'm done. I'm tired of you yelling at me all the time. I'm finished with football. And so he started to leave. He had the football and the coach said, hey, wait a minute, young man, that football belongs to the team. Bring it back. And the kid threw the football down. And then the kids continues to leave. And he says, hey, hold on a minute. Coach said, hold on a minute. That uniform belongs to the team. Take it off. So he took it off. And then he sat down on the bench. And the coach said, hey, that bench belongs to the team. Get up off of it. You can't sit there. In fact, he said, you just go ahead and leave because this practice field belongs to the team. You say, what's the point, pastor? We sometimes get mad at God but we continue to use his stuff. Am I right? We get mad at God, but how much does God own? Everything. Does he own everything you've got? Yes, he does. So we can't get mad at God and then and say, well, I'm going to continue to use your stuff. Even though I'm mad at you, I'm not going to go to church or I'm not going to, to read the Bible and I'm not going to pray and I'm not going to listen to sermons. I'm not going to sing and I'm not going to do this, not going to witness and I'm not going to give because I'm mad at you, God. We can't do that because it all belongs to him. He is generous and we ought to be generous. Here's the second thing. Our protection lies in Jesus, not material things. Our protection lies in Jesus and not in material things. Again, in verse 17, and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable, their trust should be in, what's that word there? Their trust should be in whom? God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So let me ask you this question. Where do you base your sense of security? Well, I feel secure because I've got a big bank account or I've got a, a large number in my savings account or, or in the stock market or in my retirement fund. And I feel a lot of comfort in that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things, but they are not your security. Let me ask you another question. What if all those things disappear? Then what? What if you lose your job? What if you lose your income? What if you lose your bank account, your savings, your retirement, your stock market investments? What if all of those things go away? What if it all crashes and comes crumbling down? What then? You know, it'll never happen to me. That'll never happen in America. I just went to the grocery store. <laughs> you can hardly find anything for $2 there. I walked around for probably a good hour looking for things that cost $2 or close to it. Right, right around that. Things are going up. America's what, 32, $31 trillion in debt right now? Can you imagine how much that is? I can tell you right now, you can't. I can't either. It wouldn't happen. Just a couple things happening could bring bankruptcy not only to America, but the entire world. So what happens if you lose everything? It'll never happen to us. Germany thought so as well. And then during the World War, money became so cheap that the workers started demanding that they get paid by the hour. And the workers would get their money from their boss and they would run because inflation was so high and kept climbing at such a rapid speed. They would take the money and push it through the fence to their wives. The wife would take the money and run to the grocery store so they could get a little bit more than they could get by that afternoon. Inflation was so bad the bankers went into their vaults. You'll think I'm making this up, but you can look it, look it up yourself. They went into their vaults and took out all of their cash and threw it out on the streets because it was worthless to the point they said that cars could not even drive down the street in Germany if they were in front of a bank. What if you lost everything? Then what? Proverbs 23 says this. He says it to the richest man who's ever lived, King Solomon. He said this, 
Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Who said that? Solomon, the richest man that's ever lived, said that. A wise man said that. Now, preacher, are you saying that it's wrong to possess things? Are you saying that it's wrong for us to have money? No, no, a thousand times no. I'm not saying that at all. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have things. But when the money and the things have you, then it's wrong. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When that becomes more precious to you than giving to God, then it is wrong. You see, it's about perspective in life. Really believing, I mean, we all amen it while I go, really believing that everything I have belongs to God. Not only believing it, but proving it by giving to the Lord. It's about perspective, it's about loyalty to God. That's what all of this is about. The richest people who've ever lived on the face of this earth all die the same way that you and I are gonna die. Broke. You say, what do you mean? They ain't gonna take a dime with them wherever they're going, whether it be heaven or hell. Can you imagine the God sending the, the angels to come get you when he calls you home? You say, hold on a minute. I got to make a withdrawal right quick. Is that going to happen? No. Mel Gibson for $400 million. $400 million. He was worth twice that until he got a divorce. $400 million. You know how Mel Gibson's going to die? Broke. Bill Gates worth $104 billion. You know how he's going to die? Broke. He's not taking anything with him. Tiger Woods worth almost a billion dollars. He's going to die broke just like me and you. Elon Musk, the richest man in the world right now, has $253 billion. He's going to die just like you and me. Broke. None of us are going to take anything with us when we leave. The only thing that's going to last is what we've given to God. So what have you given to God? In other words... Make your life a life of generosity. Don't be selfish and hang on to everything. Make your life a life of giving. When you're gone, do you want people to say about you, boy, they were sure selfish. They never gave anything to anybody. Went to the same church for 30 years, never gave a dime. Last church I pastored in Oklahoma, we had a couple of people that were, we had more than this, but we had two people I knew were millionaires. One, one of the guys would give, the, a multimillionaire would give about $5,000 a year to the church, making millions every year. And the lady, I kid you not, took the time to get a, an envelope and put $1 in the envelope every week. She gave $52 a year to the Lord, a multi-millionaire. When you die, do you want people to say, boy, they were selfish? Or do you want them to say, they'd give you the shirt off their back, good as gold, one of the finest, most generous people I've ever known in my life. I think we'd all rather people say about us, the latter, amen? Here's the last thing. Heaven keeps a record of your generosity. Verse 18, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true, true, you're hearing it? True life. Paul was remembering the words of Jesus when he said that. Listen to this, Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, God knows us better than we know us. The Bible doesn't say that your treasure will follow your heart. It says your heart will follow your treasure. In other words, things that you give to is where your heart is, you know? You, you men, some of you ladies, you go to work every day. Why do you do that? To give to your family. Why, why would you give to your family? Because you love your family. Amen? How many of you love your family? Yeah. You set aside money so you can give Christmas presents at the end of the year, maybe to your family and friends. Why would you do that? You invest in them. Why? Because you love them. So you save the money your heart follows. 
Wherever you put your treasure, your heart is going to follow. If you put your treasure at Spring Baptist Church, your heart's going to be here. And every single one of us ought to be giving because this is the church that God gave us to serve him in. Amen? I'm losing some of you. Amen? Amen? This is the church God's going to hold us responsible for. He's going to hold us accountable for. What did you give? What did you give in my name to bring my work to the community that you live in? What did you do? So what is God saying right here? Is he saying, is God saying, I want you to give 100% of what you have to me? No. That's not what he's saying right there. He's saying, I want you to honor me with 100% of what I've given you. There's a big difference, right? You know, there's some people that teach, well, what that means is God wants you to sell everything, live up on a mountain somewhere until he comes back. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, whatever I've given you in life, honor me. Ask about me. What would God have me do with this? You know, God gives you a car. Would God want you to use that car to go pick someone up for church on Sunday morning? Maybe. You get a raise, you say, hot diggity dog, I'm going to spend every dime of that raise on getting a new car? Or would God have you give a portion of that? Do you even think about it? Well, God wants me to give a portion of this to his work and his ministry. That's what God wants me to do. But oftentimes we get come up by windfall, we just think of ourselves first. What am I going to do with this? And we rarely think of the Lord. So here's the truth. God has given us more than we need. Huh? Some people say, I don't believe that. I don't agree with that. I'm living from paycheck to paycheck. Not even making it from paycheck to paycheck. God's not giving me more than what I need. Really? Then the Bible's not true. Because 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says, and God will generously provide all you need. Then, listen, then you will have, always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Does that say only if you're a multimillionaire? Or only if you make six figures a year? Or only if you make 20,000 a year? No, it doesn't say any of that. It's saying that if you live God's way, he's going to give you all that you need and you'll have enough to share with others. Not to raise your standard of living, but to raise your standard for giving. There's a big difference there. To give to him and to give to others. It's, it's not about our ability, brothers and sisters. It's about our priority. Do you spend every dime you make and then some? I mean, every dime I make, I spend every dime I make, and I've got credit cards hammered. When I do premarital counseling, I ask the couple, young couple, I, I'll say, let's just say, for instance, that you charge $1,000 on a credit card at 18% APR. If you know anything about credit cards, you can't get 18% APR. But you, uh, you, get, you charge $1,000 at 18% APR, and you say, oh, I can't believe I charged $1,000 on this, and you cut it up, and you never use it again, but you only pay what they re request each month to pay them back. I say, how long do you think it'll take you to pay them back? And almost invariably, the answer is two years. No, the answer is seven years. Seven years to pay back a $1,000 loan at 18% APR. Folks, when they get you in that trap, it's hard to get out of it. But with God's help, you can get out of it, amen? We offer, offer financial classes here at Spring Baptist Church that you can plug into and learn how to live God's way. And I hope that you'll take advantage of those when they're offered from time to time. So do you think about giving or do you always just think about spending? And some people say, well, pastor, I'm so obligated, I just can't give. Yes, you can. You can start. Maybe your starting place is $2 a day. I'll give up half a cup of coffee at Starbucks and I'll go to McDonald's and I'll take that and give it to the Lord. I won't eat a king size Twix bar like Pastor Mark. I'll get a half that and I'll eat that. Robin, you leave that up there after the service is over. How many of you think you give $2 a day to the Lord? More than what you're giving right now or you'll start there? Would you raise your hand? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We can all do this. 
We can all do this. Two dollars. And like I said, if it's painful for you, just give it every day online. Text the number. Two dollars, two dollars, two dollars. You never, you'll never miss it. Well, will it make any difference? About a million dollars worth. About a million dollars worth that we can use for the kingdom. I had a guy that took me to lunch right after I'd gotten here as pastor. Um, he sent me a fruitcake for Christmas. He's gone on to be with Jesus, so I can say it now. I hate fruitcakes. I think that's the kind of fruit cake they serve in hell is fruitcake. I don't like them. But I asked Bambi, I said, who is this guy? Because I didn't know who he was. And she said, oh, he's here every Sunday, second service. It's about, you know, most, almost to the back, on, right about where you guys are sitting right there. That's where he would sit every Sunday. I said, well, give me his address so I can write him a thank you. So I wrote him a thank you, and he called me up, and he said, hey, can I take you to lunch? And I said, sure. So I went to lunch over in Old Town Spring. I think it used to be called the Blue Bonnet Cafe there. And while we were eating lunch, he said, you know, Pastor, I'm getting up in my years. He was in his 80s at that time. This is many years ago. He said, I want to do something for the Lord even after I'm gone. And I said, well, I'm assuming you mean something monetarily. And he said, yes. Do you have any ideas of what we could do, something I could give, and what, what, what I could do to, that will continue on after I'm gone? I said, yeah, I've got an idea. I said, how about we start a missions fund? And when it reaches a million dollars, we'll take the interest earned off of that missions fund, less the cost of living that year, and use that missions money to do missions from now till Jesus comes. He goes, sounds like a good idea. Let's get it started. He reached in his pocket and handed me a check for $30,000. But before he moved from here out to West Texas to live with his son, that account had gotten almost to a million dollars. And we've actually bumped it a couple of times, but the stock market is so crazy right now. When it hit a million, it goes back down, hit a million, it goes back down. It's so waiting for a little bit more stability right now, but it will hit a million dollars, the good Lord willing, very, very soon. See, he, wanted, he gave to the Lord all of his life. And he was a wealthy man because he was faithful with what God gave him. I'm not saying that if you give to the Lord, he's going to make you a multimillionaire. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you, he'll make you rich. Do you understand what I mean by that? He'll make you rich. He'll give you a good life. Give to the Lord and you'll never be sorry.